This is the fertile Chengdu Plain in China's western region. As the lifeblood of the plains, water has allowed the development of an extraordinary culture and history, as well as abundant wealth. Water has brought about an eternal balance in the spirit of heaven and the earth here. The water comes from the Mean River in the northwest part of Chengdu. Water is brought to the plains by an irrigation project built 2,250 years ago. This brilliant ancient project is still enriching the Chengdu Plain today. The Warring States period in the late 4th century BC was a time of great turmoil. A famous debate on how to unify China was taking place in the northern state of Qin. General Sima Tuo proposed first capturing the neighboring state of Shu to the south, followed by the state of Chu. Following Sima Tuo's military strategy, in 316 BC, King Huiwen of Qin conquered Shu. In the autumn of the year 280 BC, 30 years after the defeat of Shu, General Sima Tuo assembled 100,000 soldiers and 10,000 warships at Shu's capital of Chengdu. This was in preparation to attack Chu along the Min and Yangtze rivers. But after capturing Xiangyu, now part of Chongqing, the army's march faltered because of inadequate supplies. This failure exposed the defects of Sima's strategy. In 272 BC, 30-year-old Li Bing of Qin was appointed administrator of Shu by King Zhao. In accordance with Qin agricultural and military culture and Sima Tuo's military strategy, the young administrator was to turn the territory into a strategic base for China's unification. It became the responsibility of the new administrator to divert the Min River to Chengdu to improve logistics for the army. Li Bing traveled for many miles to reach the source of the Min River so that he could determine how to create a stable flow of water through Chengdu from the Min River. At the same time, he wanted to ensure the safety of the cities on the plains during the flood season. Li Bing selected a point between the hills and plains to build the Dujiangyan irrigation system to control the Min River.
Li Bing led a large contingent of workers carrying bamboo cages filled with pebbles to the banks of the Mean River. There, the pebbles were ferried to the middle of the river. It took the workers over four years to build a levee in the middle of the Mean River. This levee divided the stream into inner and outer streams. The inner stream would divert the Mean River to Chengdu. But there was a problem. The Mean River stopped at Mount Jian in the northwest part of the Chengdu Plain. This mountain was a natural barrier to the only path for the inner stream. Gunpowder and other useful technology for such a monumental task had not yet been invented, so the workers had to rely on chisels and hammers. However, doing it this way would take at least three decades. The state of Qin was anxious for unification. Li Bing's wisdom is still obvious today. He directed the workers to build large fires on Mount Jian to heat up the rocks. Then had the workers pour cold river water onto them to make them crack. The workers were then able to break the rock. In this way, they greatly sped up the project. It took eight years to chisel out a waterway 20 meters wide through Mount Jian, allowing the Mean River water to flow into the plain. Later generations called the inlet to the new channel Bottleneck Channel to commemorate Li Bing's great idea. Water has been flowing through here to water the Chengdu Plain ever since the project's completion more than 2,250 years ago. In total, it took 14 years to complete the Dujiangyan, an amazing milestone in the history of water conservancy. It is still benefiting the Sichuan Plain to this day. In the year 223 BC, a large Qin army set out from Chengdu along the Min and the Yangtze rivers to attack the state of Chu. Two years later, China, for the first time, became a unified country with the establishment of the Qin Dynasty. Over 2,000 years later, people can still see the simple Dujiangyan and the channel it created. This water conservancy project was initially built for strategic shipping purposes, but after the country was unified, it continued to play a role in flood control and irrigation. It is a reflection of a splendid ancient civilization.
This water conservancy project, which was originally built for military purposes, is still in use 2,000 years after its construction, thanks to ingenious design. Li Bing selected a bend in the main river for the Dujiang Yan. He diverted the river into the main body of the project in line with the natural water flow. He also divided the stream into three parts at Fishmouth Levee, Bottleneck Channel and Flying Sand Weir at the end of the levee. Li Bing first divided the river into inner and outer streams via the fish mouth levee. Most of the time, 60% of the water flowed into the inner stream for shipping and irrigation purposes. In the summer flood season, the natural dynamics of the bend diverted over 60% of the water to the outer stream, thus preventing flooding in Chengdu. The last opening for the inner stream at the bottleneck channel controlled the flow of water to the Chengdu plain and directed excess water from the flying sand weir into the outer stream as a secondary flood control mechanism. In addition, the troublesome sediment discharge was cleverly handled. At the fish mouth levee, the inner stream is on a concave bank and the outer stream is on a convex bank. According to the physical properties of the bend, the surface water flowed towards the concave bank and the water underneath flowed to the convex bank. As a result of this, most of the gravel carried in the water near the riverbed was carried towards the outer stream by the submerged current. After the diversion, however, there was still part of the sediment flowing into the inner stream. At this time, the river channel took advantage of the momentum of the swirling flow generated by the river striking the underwater cliff to once again discharge sediment through to the riverside at the flying sand weir. The greater the flooding, the higher the rate of sand discharge, up to around 98%. The three intricate sections of the Dujiang Yan project coordinate perfectly in both flood control and sediment discharge. Its superb engineering reveals the great skill invested in the project and makes it a classic example of water control in world history. After Du Jianyan was built, Li Bing set up a system of annual river maintenance in which government organized workers would clean up the riverbed in the dry season. But what depth was taken as the standard when dredging? Li Bing buried a stone horse in the riverbed in front of the bottleneck channel and it was considered shallow enough as long as the stone horse could be seen. If it was too deep, the large amount of water introduced to the inner stream would threaten the irrigated areas, but if too shallow, the lack of water would bring on the danger of drought. The height of the flying sand weir had to be adjusted with annual maintenance to ensure that it would correctly discharge sediment and flood water. This water control technique, which has lasted thousands of years, has become regarded by people today as a classic piece of engineering. From the legend Great Flight of China, dating from ancient times, Chinese people have always instinctively been aware of the diversionary approach in water control rather than the principle of blocking, and they have followed a nature-oriented methodology. Later, the Tao follows nature philosophy favored by Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism in the Warring States period, is clearly reflected in Li Bing's water control processes dating from the same period. This philosophy became the highest standard and ideological spirit of water control. Unlike the modern Western conception of water conservancy, Li Bing did not build high dams to resist the river. He instead adopted flexible bamboo cages with pebbles and took full advantage of the momentum created by the riverbed and angles of the banks to control water quantity and flow direction in a natural way. The construction of the project and the laws of nature achieved harmony and perfect combination. 
As it was not a once and for all project, builders chose simple materials so that it could be updated via annual maintenance. This reflected the oriental concept of the best use of the situation at hand and of fundamental simplicities. But because of the perception that only crude materials had been employed, people of later times wanted to change this situation. In the Yuan Dynasty, an official named Ji Dangpu cast a huge iron turtle into a key part of the fishmouth levy. And in the Ming Dynasty, local official Shi Qianxiang put an iron bull in the fishmouth levy. Both were swept away during floods. This attitude persisted until Ming Dynasty censor Lu Yi inspected the water conservancy works in Sichuan and concluded that only Li Bing's bamboo cages method was consistent with the laws of nature. It's worth emphasizing that Du Jiangyan adopts a non-gating method in the diversion at the fishmouth levy irrigating the plain and that the water is divided by a ditch system directing it towards the vast plain in a natural way. Water flowed steadily into the Chengdu Plain through Bottleneck Channel and the convenient irrigation contributed to bumper harvests. Besides planting grain, people farmed fish in the excess water. They also processed a variety of agricultural products with water as the driving force of wheels and mills. And this led to prosperous agriculture and handicrafts industries. Local farmers who had inherited skills in sericulture dating from ancient times set up villagers and Sichuan Brocade went on to enjoy a good reputation from the Han Dynasty onwards. Lacquerware and gold and silverware from the plain were also very delicate. They were not only popular in China, they were exported to India and Mediterranean countries via the Southern Silk Road. The completion of Du Jiangyan smoothed the waterways from Chengdu to other places outside Sichuan, and so resources from the southwest and even farther regions converged at Shu. People can see evidence of Chengdu's prosperity from excavated bricks dating from the Han Dynasty. Vessels on the two tributaries of the Min River connected Chengdu to the rest of the country. During the 400 years from the completion of Du Jiangyan in the Qin Dynasty to the time of the Western Han, Sichuan experienced unprecedented economic prosperity. It was called the Land of Abundance. As a result, dynasties regarded the Chengdu Plain as an important strategic and grain-producing base. In the year 207 AD, 27-year-old Zhu Ge Liang analyzed current affairs in his famous Longzhong plan for Liu Bei. In it, he passionately portrayed the flourishing scene of the Land of Abundance and urged Liu Bei to choose Chengdu for his capital. Zhu Ge Liang recognized Du Jiangyan as the source of this affluence, and he sent General Ma Chao together with more than 1,200 soldiers to be stationed at Du Jiangyan, participating in the local annual repair he also dispatched officials responsible for Du Jiangyan's affairs. It is from the Three Kingdoms period that Du Jiangyan had an official weir system lasting until modern times. After four centuries of development following the Han Dynasty, by the Tang Dynasty, Chengdu had a population of 920,000 people. This ranked it first in the country in terms of population density, and it was China's most famous city.
400 years after the completion of Dujiang Yan, in the year 143 AD, a centenarian in robes traveled a long distance to the foot of Mount Qingcheng in the southwest of Dujiang Yan, and he lived on this quiet mountain. After a period of meditation, this old man began to spread his learning about the thought of the Yellow Emperor and Lao Tzu and founded the Way of the Celestial Masters, the only self-created religion in China, Taoism. The elderly man, said to have passed away on the mountain, was later known as the first Celestial Master, Zhang Ling. And later, Taoism began to spread across the country from this region. On Mount Qingcheng, there are many buildings constructed in the Taoist style. Taoist temples were built entirely according to the natural geographical environment in well-arranged overlapping structure. They were based also on the design of three, representing the universal concept of Taoism in that the Tao generates one, one generates two, two generate three, and three generate everything. The buildings are covered with paintings and reliefs that express Taoist ideas of non-action, health and longevity. The diagram of the Supreme Ultimate engraved on the Hall of Residence of Zhangling symbolizes yin and yang. The eight trigrams expresses the highest state of Taoism in which man is an integral part of nature. It was Zhang Ling who made people realize the importance of respecting the laws of nature. Mount Qingcheng, as the birthplace of Taoism, was favored by believers and scholars for generations. Taoism emphasizes self-cultivation and longevity. To seek the laws of longevity, Taoist priests often refined all kinds of medicinal materials in alchemical furnaces in the hopes of obtaining the elixir of life. In the middle of the 8th century AD, a priest called Qing Shuzi often collected strange recipes for the preparation of elixirs and an accidental explosion in his use of sulfur, charcoal and saltpeter helped the Chinese people to master the technology of manufacturing gunpowder a thousand years earlier than the West. As Mount Qingcheng, the holy mountain of Taoism, has more than 730 kinds of woody plants and a large number of precious medicinal materials, it has attracted many priests seeking self-cultivation. In the era of Emperor Taizong of the Tang Dynasty, Taoist priest Suan Simiao came to Mount Qingcheng. While there, he collected a large number of medicinal materials, studied a variety of herbs, and wrote the medicinal book, Formulas of a thousand gold worth.
Because of this important classic of traditional Chinese medicine, Sun Simiao was honored by later generations as the king of medicine. Taoism not only absorbs the essence of Shu culture, but is also an integral part of it. Shu culture is linked with water, and Taoism worships water too. The highest gods of Taoism are the God of Heaven, the God of Earth, and the God of Water. Different from other world religions, Taoism wants to transform nature while emphasizing harmony with nature. And the philosophy and scientific spirit of the Dujiang Yan project coincide with this Taoist conception. Li Bing, the creator of Dujiang Yan, was revered as a god by Taoism, manifesting a perfect combination of religion and science. To commemorate Li Bing, people built the Two Kings Temple on Mount Jian. In the Xianfeng reign of the Qing dynasty, Taoist Zhang Kongshan cultivated himself in this temple. Zhang Kongshan was sitting by the weir on the Mean River listening to the changing sounds of the water when he focused his energies in composing a fabulous Taoist music piece called Running Water. It is regarded as an outstanding representative work of Oriental music. The water of the Mean River winds through mountains and merges small streams into one river. Sometimes it flows ethereally and sometimes wildly. The ancient Dujiang Yan structure remains permanently between the mountains and the waters. It has become an eternal memory of the people and the planet itself for its simple and positive oriental spirit. Mm -hmm.